Welcome to this episode of Island by Film. My name is Wes. Today we're going to be looking at a photo book that I purchased probably about a year and a half ago called Two Years on a Bike. I was super fascinated by this guy's story as he traveled all the way from Vancouver to Patagonia on a bicycle over a two year period and he documented the entire trip not only in photo book format but also in video. So I followed this guy on his YouTube channel uh, and I'll leave all the links below uh, for all the information so you can follow it as well too. What a fascinating story. It actually, this photo book kind of takes me along with him on this journey. And so I'm going to go ahead and flip through this photo book as you can see. And then I'm also going to read the preface as well. I hope you enjoy this episode. And if you do, please consider liking, subscribing, and by all means, check out this guy's content and buy a copy of this book if it's still available. Two years on a bike preface. Ten years ago, I had it all. I had moved from the south of the Netherlands to Amsterdam after securing a lucrative position at a major branding firm. It was thrilling. My new exciting life in the big city. I'd bought my own apartment, lived with my gorgeous girlfriend, and commuted to a beautiful old brick building on a canal. I worked as a junior graphic designer with a team of colleagues from all over the world for big name clients and in my spare time I played in a band which I believed was my calling and yet I was miserable. The job I had started so promisingly soon became constricting. The repetition of the eight hour workday consumed me. I didn't have enough time and energy to do the things I really enjoyed like composing for my band and making music videos. At the same time, I was coming to the realization that I had lived with someone I didn't really love, but I was afraid to lose everything. I'd worked for and create an imbalance in my comfortable, perfect life. Weeks and then months passed as I slouched at my desk, contemplating my future, not having the guts to step into the ma manager's office and announce my resignation. The longer I thought about leaving it at all, it all, the more impossible it seemed. I wasn't just afraid of that meeting or that breakup. I was afraid of what would happen afterwards. Eventually, the time came when I could put it off no longer. In a bout of sudden courage, I ended the job and left the relationship. Those two things led me to new beginnings. My career developed like never before. I started freelancing at different agencies and soon I was making more money and working fewer hours. I was excited about the greater variety of projects, which made me a better designer. I had more time for my hobbies as well. The band signed a small record deal and we toured a bit around the Netherlands. Being active across multiple disciplines kept things fresh and I discovered new talents within myself. I became used to remote work and enjoyed switching offices all the time. I started to travel more, mostly on city trips and short outing outdoor adventures. Things were moving forward and it was liberating. But before I knew it, I became a victim to this new success. Slowly, I fell back into the 40 hour work week, doing exactly the same jobs as years ago, only as a freelancer this time. I couldn't reject jobs because the pay was addictive and I needed to work full time to pay for my expensive city lifestyle. I spent money on things I didn't need. I was constantly finding reasons to buy new cameras and music production gear, convincing myself I would, was investing in my career, though I was ac actually fulfilling my hunger as a consumer. I thought I was free, but I was completely stuck in the system, and it wasn't even satisfying. Meanwhile, our band was starting to hit the ceiling of our potential, and I had to accept that I was probably not going to be a rock star. Quitting the band after years of dedication into a music career was a hard thing to do. It felt like giving up, but I knew it was inevitable. I needed to escape this routine and reimagine my life again. I wasn't much of a cyclist. Of course, in Amsterdam, we ride bikes every day. But for me, that didn't mean more than a daily commute or riding to the bar to meet up with friends. It was during a city trip abroad that I had my first inkling that the bicycle could be more than a vehicle it could be at home than it could be at home. I visited Paris with my girlfriend one New Year's Eve. We drove there in a van, but I brought my bike to explore the city. I pedaled around and my girlfriend sat on the rear rack. 
leg to one side, the way Dutch couples have done for decades, as strange as it must have looked to the Parisians, who were always in a rush, it felt so familiar to me, exploring places on my own bike gave me an incredible feeling of being at home, even in places far from home. I didn't know it at the time, but that Paris trip had planted a seed, and it was now taking root years later. What if I packed a bike to the max and rode it really far? I'd always dream of long-term travel, but there were so many reasons to not do it. The band, the jobs, the mortgage, the income. Like most people, I was afraid that I couldn't leave it behind, let alone do it without the comforts and luxuries of my life in Amsterdam. But maybe a bike was the only home I needed. Perhaps experimenting with a short trip would give me some answers. So in 2014, I bought a proper touring bike, a surly long haul trucker, and I planned a two week trip to Switzerland. My friends laughed at me. You won't even make it to Miss Ray. It was December when I left, but I was too excited to wait for spring. Besides, if I ever wanted to cycle the world, I needed to be able to face all types of weather. It turned out that I loved it. The sense of freedom, the exercise, the new horizons every day, the documenting the whole thing vigorously. I felt like I'd found something I could do for a long time, and so I decided to go for it. I would travel the world on my bike. I would live a simple life out of a few bags, following a routine that, that always delivered something new. Every day I would work for eight hours, but the work would be in the saddle behind handlebars, not in a chair behind a computer. I wouldn't be paid in money, but in memories. To fund my first big trip, I took a lot of jobs to save as much money as possible. Renting out my apartment would cover my mortgage and monthly expenses. But with my current spending habits, I still didn't know how I was going to afford, say, a year-long journey. Certainly, my taste in restaurants and hotels needed to change. The goal of this trip was not only to see the world and indulge in all its exotic beauty, but also to take a step back from the never-ending materialistic lifestyle I took part in. Choosing to travel by bike was helpful in this regard, because it forced me to limit what I brought with me. There was fear to overcome, there was creativity to develop, I needed to get physically stronger and mentally tougher. I needed to be able to sleep under the stars. As excited as it was, I was nervous about pulling it off. Bike touring through the Netherlands and Germany hadn't been all that challenging. The climate, infrastructure, language, and culture were familiar and safe. Crossing deserts in Iran and getting over the Himalayas on a loaded bicycle would be a different game. On April 16, 2015, I had handed over the keys to my apartment and pedaled out of Amsterdam. I had vaguely informed family and friends that I was cycling to China, only to give an idea of the direction and magnitude of my travel intentions. Travel visas, political unrest, and troublesome areas would be addressed on the way. There were no routes, no plans, and no destinations. In the coming weeks and months, I would play it by ear and figure out if this was something for me. It made sense to approach it that way. It felt liberating not to have a plan. It was the only way to really live in the moment. Once I set off, life was very clear to me. The simplicity of traveling the world by bike gave me focus. Everything had purpose. All things loaded onto my bike had been carefully thought through. I knew exactly what was in each bag and where everything was packed. I was fueled by a desire to produce stunning photos and writing. I camped in beautiful places, crossed Europe's green fields and forests, and I moved toward the Far East. I lost weight, got a tan, looked better, and felt great. Of course not everything was easy. There were days of saddle pain, aches in my right knee during the first long climbs in the Carpathian Mountains, and occasionally stomach bugs. I stayed in mainly huge hotels and longed for communication in places where no one spoke English or where internet connection was not prioritized. I had to give in to many moments of hardship and give up the level of comfort and luxury I was used to, yet overcoming these obstacles only made me stronger and all of the difficult moments grew into, a pow into powerful memories. I gained mental resilience and discovered a new expansive version of myself.
After a thrilling journey from Amsterdam to Singapore through 18 countries and over 17,000 kilometers, I arrived home, rich in memories and quite broke. Frankly, I'd started missing my job after one year. The design agencies booked me again and normal life slowly took over as if nothing had changed. The big difference, however, was that I had changed. I was better able to appreciate the little things and the larger comforts of life in the Netherlands with its healthcare system, good infrastructure, my nice apartment, and everything I used to take for granted. I started to work on a book and a film about my journey six months after my return home, one year on a bike from Amsterdam to Singapore had come out and it is now being sold all over the world. After about a year in Amsterdam, the inevitable itch to travel again returned. This time I wanted to see if I could combine my working life with cycling. Since most of my work was done behind my laptop, I just needed a chair, a table, and Wi-Fi, and I knew I could find these things anywhere in the world. Convincing my clients was not easy, since most of the agencies I worked for were used to having me in their offices. They were afraid that the time difference and my physical absence wouldn't work for them but I strongly believed that it would be possible and that the traveling would open even more doors down the road. Since I had already cycled the farthest I could overland from Europe, the choice for this new route was obvious, North and South America. I needed an extreme distance with a destination that would always seem out of reach. It would be even better if it crossed continents. The simplicity of a single line from North to South, from one side of the globe to the other, sparked my imagination in the same way that biking to Singapore had. I had always wanted to explore the Western United States, the most geologically interesting part of the country, and I had never been to Latin America. I chose Vancouver, British Columbia as my starting point. It was a bit late in the season to start from Alaska and Vancouver would be a better place to get all the parts for my new bike setup. Besides, I had friends there and some freelance work to finish up. This time my design work would dictate my planning so I could keep my income while on the road. If there was work for me, I would settle in a town. If there was no work, I would cycle, take photos, and write my way from one end of the world to the other.
If you've made it this far in the video, then you've seen some amazing photographs from photographer, creator, and adventurer Martin Doulard. I'm going to leave some links below uh, for you to follow some of his other content because I cannot recommend it enough. It's like you get to live vicariously through him as he adventures and experiences life. So, Anyway, thank you so much for watching this episode of Island by Film. I really, really appreciate you stopping by. I really appreciate you making this far in the video. It means a lot. If you like this kind of content, please leave a like, consider subscribing, and even leave a comment because I would like to get some feedback from you uh, for future episodes. So once again, thanks for joining me on Island by Film. My name is Wes.